we did start a series on buy the truth and do not sell it. And uh, we spoke last time at, at uh, some length in 2 Corinthians 4, I believe, verse 2, where we were talking about the way the apostles handled the words. Now we look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, for a day, about rightly handling the word of truth. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. I remember the words of uh, Tom Roberts, a faithful gospel preacher, if you don't know him, who said that the scriptures indeed must be interpreted, but they are not just up to interpretation. You can't take out of it what God didn't put into it. It's meant to be understood, and it's meant to be understood correctly. 2 Timothy 2, at verse 15 is our verse for today. Do your best to present yourself to God, says Paul to the young evangelist Timothy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And there have been many different translations, I think, of this. Some of them are quite confusing, I admit. So, As we typically do, we'll start with some definitions, and then we will go to how the scriptures use the same word to understand that even more. In 2 Timothy 2.15, there is a phrase there that says, rightly handling the word of truth. Um, I think King James says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, There's probably other idioms that occur in scripture or in uh, various translations. But the meaning here uh, from the the Greek language is is, uh, cutting in a straight line. It's made of ortho, which you might recognize from orthodontist, who straightens teeth, (laughs) or orthodox, who teaches the straight truth, Um, and tome, like uh, appendectomy, uh, removing the appendix or cutting out the appendix. So this is a straight cut, cut in a straight line. And uh, when you use this as an adverb um, or as an adjective, a way of describing something, it means straight. So if we're talking about something that is upright or that is standing, um, we mean something that is upright, something that is standing up. In fact, the fact that we say upright is uh, coming from this because you may recall from, well, probably middle school, uh, that a right angle is 90 degrees. And that the 90 degree angle is perpendicular to the ground. That is the thing that is straight up, upright, or ortho, orthodox. <laughs> Upright, standing straight. In geometry, it's a right angle. If you're talking about a line, you're talking about a line that is a straight line, not a curved one or off um, at a slant or an angle or an incline. It's the one that is perpendicular, the 90 degree. I found that this word that the New Testament uses Um, was actually used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for a couple of Proverbs, and it seemed like that would be a useful thing to bring forward for us to consider. What does it mean to cut straight the Word of God, to make cut straight lines, if you will? Well, here's one such place where it is used, again, in translation, but a reasonably good one by Greek speakers. Proverbs 3, 6 said, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths, as in he will cut straight lines as your paths. Perhaps you think of bushwhacking or making trails in the wilderness, whatever it might be. But yeah, the straight path is the the fastest way. It's the easiest way. There's full sight forward and backward. Right? There's many advantages to the path being straight if you look at it that way. If you're trying to get lost, then you prefer curvy roads. 
And in Proverbs 11:5, the righteousness, or uh, yeah, the righteousness of the blameless one keeps his way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. So the person who is blameless, the person who is just or right, righteous, uh, is protected by his own justice. That is what keeps him going in the correct direction, keeps his way straight. The wicked, on the other hand, is not going, he's falling, he's tripping. His way is not straight, and it's by means of his own wickedness that he is falling. Which is an interesting thing when you think about traverse and travel in the world. It has a little bit less to do with the road and more to do with the traveler who is on that road. What happens? And that's true in life. Uh, there are dangerous roads, no doubt. But there are many more dangerous drivers. So here the blameless keeps his way straight by means of his justice, by means of his righteousness. And again, in the prior proverb, God makes our path straight when in all our ways we acknowledge him. So if we put these together and say, what does it mean, Timothy, to handle the word of God rightly? It means in all your reading, of his word, all your use and application of it, you acknowledge him, and he will make the path straight. In the book of the Acts, you see that the church is typically referred to as the way, which means the road, the path. Now, if you go into the New Testament, the same word is used in only a few places, but I'm grabbing the ones that I think are useful for our understanding. Mark 7, verses 32 and 35 is one such place where Jesus heals a man that has a speech impediment, unable to talk or at least unable to be make himself understood, and was deaf as well. So when Jesus healed him, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and verse 35 tells us that he spoke plainly, which is to say, he rightly handled his speech, <laughs> cut straight his speech. Um, I think that we know what this means. I mean, if a person is, is deaf, there's a certain speech impediment that accompanies that that's typical, but there's also a speech impediment, not just the deafness here for him. He has a problem with the ear and the tongue, both. So his speech is very unintelligible. He is hard to follow. And uh, the Lord made it so that he speaks plainly now. He can be understood. Meaning his words can be understood. He can make himself clear. Uh, they can follow him now. Where, and he can make known what it, he intends and what he thinks about things and what he's asking for. That was not the case before. This is rightly handling. Then in Luke 7, verses 41 to 43, we have another use of right, or rightly handling, straight cut. Luke 7, 41 to 43, Jesus poses this parable. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. I remind you, a denarius is one day's wages. Somebody owes 50, that is a month and a half, a little more than that. Somebody owes 500, that's more than a year's worth of wages. When they couldn't pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And the fellow on the other end there, Simon was his name, and said, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. That is rightly handling the judgment. That's a straight line you have cut there. So he made a judgment. It's very clear. It should be clear. As he said, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And why is he so timid in his answer? Well, because he's trying to trip Jesus up and he realizes he just lost. 
Mm -hmm. That was correct. Good job, Simon. So then Luke 10, uh, 25 to 29 is another such place. And again, a lawyer is putting Jesus to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two great commandments. Jesus himself said these were the two great commandments. I don't know whether this, uh, whether this lawyer had heard him say that before or whether he actually got something right. You know, the stopped clock is right twice a day. The stopped analog clock. Digital, that doesn't happen anymore. Sorry, kids. He said, you have answered correctly. Do this and live. That's correct. That is a straight cut right there. That is rightly handled. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> the desire to justify ourselves really does lead to a whole lot of definition arguments. He said, oh yes, I do love my neighbor as myself. I just define the term neighbor very narrowly. Meaning, I don't love everybody. That's what he's doing. But Jesus already gave him the answer, which is, oh, that is correct. Love the Lord, love your neighbor. Do this and live. But he wanted more. He was testing the Lord. He was trying to justify himself. He wants this definition argument about what is a neighbor anyway. Because that's how they got out of everything. They were allowed to mistreat people they did not, I mean, they, they allowed themselves, the law didn't really allow it, but they allowed themselves to mistreat people who did not fit their definition of neighbor. But he had already answered correctly. The truth is simple. Cut that straight line. That's the simplest thing right there. Now, we mentioned before, uh, this other passage that I'm going to go pull up for you, 2 Corinthians 4.2, and I'll remind you of it a little bit, because this is the parallel passage. And I think putting this together with 2 Timothy, uh, with 2 Timothy is, is worth doing for our understanding. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, Paul writes, We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Meaning we commend ourselves by means of the open statement of truth. I.e., we don't need letters of recommendation and we don't recommend ourselves. Listen to the message. Is this right or not? That's what he means. As for, uh, as for the, uh, we refuse to practice cunning. Remember, that's our word for ready to do anything. Which I still find a chilling definition. But it's true. Some people are ready to do anything. Whatever it takes to accomplish their agenda. Right or wrong. They don't care. And the other word uh, that occurs here, this uh, tampering, um, I will remind you, comes from the word for bait. It's bait for fish. The worm has been tampered with because there's a hook in it. It's a trick, a snare, a trap, a disguise. The garment that has been dyed, so it's a different color from its natural color. You don't know what its real color was, right? This is bait. And again, it's the word that's like a net, a mouse trap, uh, a trick, uh, a stratagem, or a spy. 
you know, double agent. Okay, so these are coming from uh, 2 Corinthians 4.2. And again, the significance of this is that 2 Corinthians 4.2 is actually parallel uh, to our text today in 2 Timothy 2.15. And I hope you're asking how, because I'm about to show you. <laughs> if you're not asleep yet. For those of you who are not asleep yet, I'm about to show you how. It is, I'm going to stop this, sorry. I don't know what I've done there. 2 Corinthians 4.2 and 2 Timothy 2.5, or 2.15 are parallel. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.2 is about the apostles and how the apostles have presented themselves to the churches in, in uh, Corinth and in uh, the Greek speaking, or the, uh, yeah, the Greek city, spa, uh, city states. 2 Timothy 2 is written to one evangelist, Timothy. What do they have in common? Is Timothy an apostle? No. What then do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is they are both of them delivering the word of God. And people have to hear the word of God for what it is without regard to the messenger through whom that word has come. That's what we're getting at. The second Corinthians 4, 2 said we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Well, this word for disgraceful, we didn't define it earlier, but I will tell you, this is actually the word shameful. Shameful, underhanded ways which is how you know it's parallel to 2 Timothy 2.15, because he said that this person, a faithful preacher, is a worker who has no need to be ashamed. So if you handle the word of God correctly, if you are straight in your dealings with God's word and teach it correctly, then you have no need to be ashamed. You have done the work. That is your job. And in 2 Corinthians 4, they've renounced any shameful ways of doing things. They're workers who have no need of being ashamed because they've renounced the shameful ways of doing things. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, they said we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. These are the things we looked at just now. Willing to do anything or using bait. And that, you know, characterizes just about every marketing campaign you see <laughs> from religious organizations today. They are uh, willing to do anything to get people in the door. And the tampering is true. They invite you to have pizza with them. And before you can eat pizza, you have to talk about Jesus. <laughs> Come play basketball, and then they spring Jesus on you. I remember a friend of mine who was a football player and said that Jesus was not welcome in his huddle. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, Jesus is always welcome in my perspective, but a football huddle is not the place. That he's right that they have juxtaposed the sacred and the profane and mixed them together. It's not appropriate, is what he's saying, and he's right. So no bait and switch, no willing to do anything. No, you have to do this correctly. Use the word the way that it is intended. That is what will get people, not the hook and the worm. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, the apostles said they are commended by open statement of truth. Not necessarily by those who listen to them or know them, but by open statement of the truth we would commend ourselves. And in 2 Timothy 2, 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. These are the same thing, aren't they? 
If you think that you're going to stand before God, it's not going to be on your own merits, on your own uh, virtue. It's going to be because you uh, lived the truth. You obeyed the truth. You taught the truth. That's how you are approved before the judgment seat of God. And again, 2 Corinthians 4.2 said, they are commending themselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The conscience is um, a very pecu a peculiar word in your New Testament. Um, we think of conscience as a nagging voice inside of you that, you know, tells you when you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. Um, that's not the meaning of this word. It's, it is actually the literal, uh, the reason they've gone with conscience is because of the, uh, the literalness, I guess, of con and science. Science is Latin for knowledge, and con is also Latin for with. So the thing that shares your knowledge um, what we would call maybe metacognition, as in what what I know that I know, or what I know that I could know if I bothered to find out, but I just choose not to look at that. You know, that's the biblical idea of the conscience. But what Paul is actually saying here is, people can know by, if you will, third party verification against the word itself that we are legit. That's what he's saying. It's a little hard to understand this from the translation, but that's the meaning here, is that it shares the knowledge. It, you can find out on your own by third-party verification through the word that what they're saying is correct. But he's doing this in the sight of God. And 2 Timothy is doing the same. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. People may not approve, uh, in fact, if you're doing this right, there's always going to be people who don't approve. But God is the one with whom we have the deal in the judgment day, and he is the one who has to be pleased and to approve of us. We seek not the approval of men, but of God. Uh, final note on conscience. It is the word used in Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. You may recall Ananias says uh, they sold a property for such and such an amount, and that was false. They had sold it for more than that. But he wanted them to think that he was giving 100% of the sale price. It wasn't wrong for him to give a portion of the sale price. That was okay. It was wrong for him to tell them that that was everything, that he kept nothing. That was false. It says, then his wife or he held back a portion of the property with his wife's full knowledge. It literally says his wife being the conscience. She's the third party verification. She knows the truth about this. Is what it means. She shares that knowledge. She knows exactly what actually happened. Which is why she fell dead when she came in and affirmed the same amount. Because she knew that was a lie. That's the meaning of conscience. Okay, so these who are teaching and these who are preaching, we who are preaching perhaps, are trying to do this in the sight of God. And the way that you know when, that somebody is faithful or not is open statement of the truth. And this is something we've said before, and I will remind you in closing that the core competency of a gospel preacher is faithfulness. I realize that people tend to think or tend to want for the gospel preacher to be personable or to be an excellent orator. A speaker, somebody who can do presentations really well, 
somebody who is a professional. Um, none of these things are found in the Bible, though. That's all made up. If you have those things and you put them to use in the service of God, well, who can blame you? But that's not the competency of the gospel preacher. The competency of the gospel preacher is faithfulness. Does he trust God? Does he trust God's word? Does he give this open statement of the truth? And that is what commends him. That's the pure gospel. That is the, the truth of the matter. The best preacher is the preacher who most closely adheres to the standard of God's word. That's how that is. And it's God who has to approve. It's God who has to be good with us. It's not something that we do uh, or that we decide that like as if we appoint somebody, we decide what, what's good for us. No, we use God's word and we use it as it said earlier, not in any way that requires us to be ashamed about it later. We do so very openly, very clearly. There's no cunning or tampering. We, we are not willing to do just anything. We are principled when we teach it. We're not baiting or hiding something. We are taking the straight path, rightly handling, meaning you're going in the front door. It's very clear what you're doing. You're walking in in you know, in the sunlight, in plain sight of everybody, we know what you are about. We know what you're trying to accomplish. That's the way that it is supposed to be when you are teaching God's word. And that is how you will be approved in the sight of God. And hopefully in everybody else's conscience too, although you're not in control of that. All right. Thank you. If today you are not a Christian, become a child of God. We have talked here briefly. We've talked briefly about um, the need for teachers to present themselves approved to God. But every Christian needs to do this. And every person on earth needs to reckon with God and to be ready to present themselves to him in the judgment day. There is coming a judgment day that God has fixed, in which all of us will give an answer for everything done in the body, whether it is good or whether it is evil. We will be judged by the words that Jesus spoke. So have you made your life clear? Have you made your life clean? Are you justified before God? Able to stand and say, well, this it was written and this is what I did. If today you're not a Christian, you're not you're not ready. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus. We are very desirous of helping you to obey the gospel and baptism for forgiveness of sins, believing in Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. You put to death the old person of sin and are resurrected a new person created in Christ Jesus for good works. If today... You are a Christian who has not been living right. You also are not ready for the judgment day. You will be lost if you are not maintaining the faith, if you are not staying faithful to your Lord and to his word, regardless of how people are treating you. We will help you to uh, repentance by praying on your behalf, perhaps by some encouraging word, perhaps by lifting some burden from your shoulder, if you will let that spiritual need be known. Either way, if you need our prayers or if you need to obey the gospel, don't put these things off. There's not something more important than the work of God. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.